Hi everyone, and welcome back to Relationships Rock episode three. Last week, we had an amazing guest. Thank you again, Shana, for having joined us. And we touched upon so many ideas that I actually think it was a really good, like, kind of like an introduction to a lot of the topics that we'll be really going into depth about in this series on Shidduchim. So for today's episode, I actually want to take one of those questions that we asked and discussed last week and really go in depth. Are you ready for it? What should you look for in a spouse? That's it. That's all we're answering today. What should you be looking for in a spouse? And I actually want to answer this question by asking another question. I know that's super Jewish, but it's honestly true. What truly matters in a marriage? Because when you're looking, you know, when we look at dating as the goal is to get married, right? Then it kind of changes our focus of what is dating, right? The goal of dating is to get married. So First of all, you're looking for a spouse. What should you what should you look for in a spouse? So then we have to look at well, what really matters in a marriage? And we can actually break this question even further. Like, what's the goal of marriage? Right? I want you to think about examples of healthy, beautiful marriages that you have seen throughout your life. And think about well, what about those marriages or relationships stood out to you? What about them would you like to emulate? There's actually research that has been done um, by Rabbi Dr. Rabbi Yitzchak Schechter, who's amazing, by the way. Um, I know his wife from Stern. And he was doing research on the divorce rate in the Jewish community. And what he found is that it's one out of 10 marriages instead of in, in, the, in the non-Jewish world, it ends up being about one in two marriages. And, you know, he also did research about to see if it's, if it's true that if you come from a divorced home, you have, you have a higher likelihood of getting divorced. And he found that in the Jewish community, it's actually not the case that the fact that you came from a divorce home does not necessarily correlate to getting divorced because in the Jewish community, people are so exposed to marriages in general that as long as they had like a healthy, beautiful marriage that they saw, that they learned what good communication is like, what love is like, what respect is like, it's, it's almost like the fact that their parents were divorced doesn't affect them, which, by the way, is super powerful. And I think we'll have a whole episode just talking about divorce. There's like so much, so, so many layers and aspects of where it influences dating as well um, as marriage. But kind of going with this, this, you know, finding of, well, if you have a healthy idea of what a marriage looks like, it guides you. So let's think about a healthy marriage that we have in our minds and how it could guide us into figuring it out, okay, what truly matters in a marriage? What am I really looking for? I once heard this from my Ephraim Goldberg. He said, when you go into a meeting, you know, you have to always keep in mind what you want the goal to be. Because once you have your objective very clearly defined, then you know exactly how to approach the meeting, right? You know what to say, what not to say, because you're so focused on the goal. Like, let's say you want, you're, you're upset with somebody but you want them to do something for you. So you can't go into that meeting screaming your head off because they're not going to do that for you, right? So you have to like approach it smartly. So here too, you know, we the goal is marriage. The goal is not just a marriage. The goal is a happy, healthy marriage. So that's our objective. So how are we going to get there? But having that objective clear is really going to guide us in that process. You know, I think sometimes when we're dating we lose track of the goal. We're kind of focused more on the dating part, the boyfriend and girlfriend fun time period. And sometimes I think we could lose focus of everything that comes afterwards. So I want to ask you again, what truly matters in a marriage? And Amir Hashem, by answering this question, will be able to better answer what should you be looking for? You know, when I think of marriages that are beautiful, you know, those that like make you believe in love, Honestly, I don't think of any particular couple. Of course, there are many that I have seen just beautiful aspects that I have, you know, tried um, to emulate as well as with parenting and so forth. But I kind of get this like hazy image of this old couple. You know what I'm talking about? Like they're they're like bickering, they're bantering, they're laughing. He opens the door for her. They're still holding hands. And they've been through so much together. And that's kind of what I picture of, you know, the end goal is really that lifetime partner, that lifetime support. And honestly, and I'm being serious, I actually really did this exercise myself trying to think, okay, like, what do I picture? 
I think that this image really represents the three things that truly matter in a marriage. Number one, friendship. You know, you're going to be going through this journey called life with this person forever, ups and downs and all around. I know at this point in your life, dating really seems like a big deal and it totally is. I'm not trying to minimize it at this moment in life. It really is um, such a big aspect, but there's so much that comes afterwards, really. For some, it's infertility and it's so, so sad and painful when you know, girls who I saw struggle getting married and then afterwards they, they reach out about, you know, infertility and so forth. I'm also a college teacher or just the ups and downs of parenting, careers, losing jobs. Unfortunately, later on, it comes with the death of family members. There's so much that we go through in life, you know, dating is really, I feel like just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, and in so many ways, by the way, I feel like the relationship you built with God um, and the munah that you build during this time period really comes as a foundation for everything that comes afterwards. I actually, side point, I just heard, um, I think her name is Charlene, right? Am I getting that right? Aminoff, um, in a podcast yesterday. And she was saying how, you know, she had a daughter who um, basically drowned, so sad, and really a big niece. She was, you know, clinically dead for three minutes and then came back to life. And she says, you know, people think that that's, chapter one, but it's really chapter 26 in my life. And I found that to be such a powerful statement because yes, we have so many chapters that just build our muna and those and those muscles and that trust and that connection to Hashem. So I think that Shidduchem, as difficult as it is right now, it's really a foundation of, of your own relationship with God, which is going to play up throughout your life in ups and downs. So anyways, life is a life is a crazy journey and this is the person that you're gonna you're gonna be with you know who's gonna go through this journey with you and you know in order to have uh friendship and you can think of this even with with your own friends you need to have common ground obviously you have to have some similar interests of course values and most importantly you need to respect each other you know the number one shalom bite advice that i give is respect i have seen just implementing respect flip an entire relationship literally from from one side it doesn't even have to be both sides i think that it's when you show respect to the other person when you apologize when you do something that they have might have misinterpreted as disrespectful you know it's not always what we say but how we say it um everything else flows it's like it's really just such an important basis of of, of having that of having that of having that relationship you know, in a friendship, you also support each other. I mean, how many crazy ideas have your friends had? And, uh, and you're like, seriously? But you're there. You know, you go to the event that you know will flap. You listen to the podcast, hi, friends, um, or whatever else they had in mind, right? And that's what your spouse is also. You know, they're your friend. They respect you. They support you. And I want to just add a quick disclaimer here. I think, you know, just because your spouse is your friend doesn't mean that they have to be your only friend or even your best friend. I actually think that people have this mentality of like, oh, I'm marrying my best friend. I actually don't think so. I know that's a little bit of an unpopular thought here. I told you, I don't shy away from controversy. I think that um, sometimes people kind of hold on to this best friend idea and then they kind of create this person who's going to like fulfill all of their needs and just get them perfectly. And it's like, no, you're marrying someone from the opposite gender. It's impossible for them to really understand you. I think that your spouse can be a great friend, a really good friend, a fun friend, but they don't have to be your only friend. And I don't think they even have to be your best friend. I think it's like a completely different category. Um, but but yeah, I think you have to keep that in mind so that it's not, you know, I've seen people kind of get disappointed like, oh, well, you know, they, they're not fulfilling all my needs. It's like, well, they're not really supposed to. Okay, number two banter fun you know i picture this old couple really enjoying their company and also knowing when to joke around actually i read this book i think it's called the seven highly effective something or other of a successful couple something like that i totally just butcher the name and in it he says how um he actually studied couples and i think he's able to determine if a couple's going to get divorced like a 90 percent you know accuracy or something and one thing he would do is he would actually film couples arguing and what he found was that couples who are, you know, happy, successful, have a effective marriage, know when to make a joke. He said, like, one couple, like, if they were arguing in the middle, like, the wife would just pretend to have a gun and be like, bow, 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 you know, like, I, I shot you or something. And then they would just start cracking up, like, you're so silly, you're so silly. And then, like, they kind of make up. Like, it almost kind of brings down the heat, right? I think you have to have that fun aspect when you're, when you're married. You have to joke around, you know, you have to enjoy doing stuff together. I don't think you have to do everything together. You don't have to love the same things. But you have to enjoy the time 
that you have together. I think actually this is something that you could really look at in the beginning of any relationship. Sometimes people look at it a little bit too deeply in the first two dates. You know, they kind of want to see, okay, do we have all of this? You know, and again, it's a little bit of an unrealistic expectation that's up hurting you because this is a stranger. You know, you're just starting to get to know this person and really take your time. I'm all for hate until you date. I think you should enjoy each other's company. But in the beginning, what you really want to be asking is, do you want to get to know them more? You know, do you smile when you're with them? Do you miss them when they're not with you? You know, this is the part where it's not about what other people think. It's not about the list you have or if they check those boxes. It's about how do you feel when you're with this person? A good and healthy person for you should always make you feel comfortable, good, happy, and at ease. It doesn't mean that everything has to flow all the time. There are awkward silences, even when you're married. You know, it doesn't mean that he or she needs to know exactly what to say and be super slick and read your mind. No, it just means that overall, how you feel with this person is a positive experience, right? You overall enjoy spending time together. So number one, friendship, respect. Number two, banter fun and number three they hold hands that's really what i picture this this kind of this old couple right and that's where i think you know attraction and love and chemistry come in these are all important aspects and you know i actually don't think we should downplay their importance i think it's detrimental to do that but i think we also have to have realistic expectations you know this is from dating and yet we have so many goyish expectations about what we're going to feel and how we're going to know it you know like a spark firework and I really don't believe that. I think real attraction, real chemistry, real love grows. So we have to separate like baseline attraction from growing attraction, right? When singles ask me like, okay, well, at what point do I keep dating or not? Like if I don't feel something, right? The attraction piece. So I think you have to really see if the attraction is growing. You know, has it moved anywhere from date one to date three? You know, do you feel repulsed or do you feel just like neutral? You have to really ask yourself, which many people don't, what are you expecting to feel? Can you say out loud? Because sometimes when you say out loud what you're expecting, you may find that it's unrealistic. Or perhaps you can't even define it because it's like you haven't even really processed, okay, well, what what am I expecting, right? I think obviously Disney Disney and you know romance novels and so forth really are a lot to blame for these unrealistic expectations. And, and though a lot of us don't have that in our homes. You know, I think the older generation for sure definitely watched, you know, Disney movies and didn't see them as harmful. Um, but even if we don't, I think there's just so much that's getting into the from world. It's like impossible. Um, you know, when we think of, you know, our wedding day as the happiest day of our lives, and obviously it is a happy day, right? And what you feel for your spouse on your wedding day should not compare what you feel each passing year. Like there's something so important in love, which is called commitment which is called a giving. And that's something that's completely ignored in Disney movies, which is, by the way, why sequels are always horrible because they kind of ruin this concept of happily ever after, right? It's like, it, it's like almost, it's like, well, something has to happen, right? Because really, when you say you love someone, um, you're saying, yes, I'm committed to you and I'm going to work for forever after and hopefully happily, right? So, you know, I, I think with Disney, it's like, you know, they just meet, they don't even talk. You have Little Mermaid, right? They, they don't even speak to each other. And it's like, oh, I just know, like, that's my soulmate. Actually, Little Mermaid is really messed up. It's like assimilation, changing who you are, losing your voice. Like, it's just pretty dark stuff, to be honest. But all of this is really infiltrated, kind of that, that specific expectation I'm talking about of like, I will just know. I actually heard this from a student of mine when I was teaching at Turo. And she said to me that her father, who's a Rav, says how, you know, there's three couples in Tanakh. You have Abraham and, and Sarah, you have Yitzhak and Rivka, and you have Yaakov and Rachel. And each one kind of represents like a different type of relationship that, that, we, that we could build, right? Or of how people meet. You know, Abraham and Sarah is like the girl next door, you know, the whole family, right? Yitzhak and Rivka is more like they're very logical, they have a list. Um, even, you know, we, we see in, in Tanakh that love comes afterwards for them, right? And now we have Yaakov and Rachel, which is like love at first sight. I think most people kind of get fixated with Yaakov and Rachel and they feel like they're going to have a Yaakov and Rachel experience. And listen, you might. Um, I, you know, I think when Yaakov saw Rachel and he knew that that she was for him, I don't think it was necessarily this like physical attraction, but just this understanding of, wow, this person 
is exactly what I need, right? And it's, it's my partner in this world, kind of like the neshama recognized each other, which is so really beautiful. Um, I think when you, you know, when I speak to singles about this and I say, well, you know, like most of my friends tell me that they knew. And I think most people, to be honest, do not feel a crazy attraction in the beginning. That's number one. Um, but they don't want to say that out loud anymore because they're married to this person, right? And we also kind of sometimes just kind of want to look back at the we kind of look at things more like rosy especially when you're engaged or newly married so i think that you know you really don't want to base your own experience on what other people have told you that happens you might have a yaakov and rachel expectation you know you might have a an actual yaakov and rachel reality you might just meet the person and be like whoa this is for me but you might have abraham and sarah you might have your second rifka and i don't think that you know any of those is is bad you have to just realize that there's a lot of ways that you could know and meet your spouse. So I want to go a little bit more into depth about, you know, looks and attraction. <clears throat> I know this is a sensitive subject, but honestly, all of Shidochim is really a sensitive subject because you're dealing with people's emotions and money and so forth. So, so yeah, let's, let's, let's go right in. I know looks are important. I'm really not downplaying it. And if you have worked with me, you know that I really don't ignore that when, when, you, when you mention that. Um, but I think chemistry goes beyond what someone looks like. You know, I know like I sound like a broken record. <laughs> I always talk about loving yourself, but if someone doesn't love themselves, if someone has low self-esteem, it's very hard for them to love somebody else, to accept somebody else. You know, some people think like, oh, if I just marry a good looking person, you know, I'm going to be happy. But you know, I don't think that it's like a this like magical solution, right? Like, oh, as long as I marry that, I'm gonna I'm gonna be happy. There's so much layers to that. You know, this is where I think you know the danger of like the shidduch pictures comes in because when you're looking at pictures and you're like, wow, like I'm in love that just from that picture, you know, Disney princess fireworks just from a picture. And I'm sorry, but honestly, I don't think it's gonna work. I I think that most of the time when people have that, it almost like works against them because chemistry goes so much more beyond a picture i think you really want to look at pictures as a baseline to see if 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 you can work with that and if you feel like you know what there's no way that i could be attracted to this person like you know that's totally fine um i know that there's like a double standard when it comes to you know to looks and attraction i know that girls complain all the time that they're forced to give a yes to a guy even if they don't find him attractive and, you know, honestly, and this is, I know people hate it when you get like very logical, but I think that's just a reality, which is that girls get less yeses than guys. So, you know, should Khanam kind of say like, well, listen, I know he's not perfect or what you picture, but like, why not go out? You know, because unfortunately you might not get a yes for another few months. And, and I know that this is the reality, you know? So, you know, I... I don't, I don't think that anyone's trying to say, oh, the fact that you're not attracted doesn't matter. I think that the reality is that there is a basic biology. I hope I don't get flagged down for, for speaking about basic biology. For women, love and attraction are very connected and very emotional. The more you love someone, the more they become attractive. And I'm sure you've, you know, ladies out here, you've met people that you find like originally very attractive and you get to know them and you're like, ew, you know, like it just, it's very, very emotionally connected. Whereas for guys, it really does work differently. It really is a little bit more black and white. And this is probably why you kind of feel like there's this double standard. Um, but I, I, I really do think that when you're focused on the attraction piece, just look at it as a baseline. Because otherwise, you know, everyone has a picture in their head. Everyone has this like imaginary unicorn. Um, I know, I, I, I know that, but not... You know, we don't, a buckle didn't come out in Shemaim and tell you exactly who you're going to marry. We don't know what that person is going to look like. We don't know what they're going to be like. So when you stick to, and, and I mentioned this in the first episode, really boiling down to, okay, do they have the three things I will not compromise on, right? What truly matters in a marriage? I, I can't tell you how many times I hear girls say, yeah, yeah all I care about is meadows. I want someone with like really good meadows. And then I suggest one and they're like, well, he's too short or I'm not attracted to him or this and this and that. And it's like, well... Are you focused on the meters or are you focused on the on, on the looks part, right? And I, I'm not trying to be so blunt. I hope I'm not hurting anyone's feelings. You know that I'm, I'm respectful for whatever. I actually heard this in Shidduch Roundtable. Shout out to you, uh, anonymous person behind the scenes. I actually literally took a picture of it because it was so good. This girl said, or at least I think it was a girl. She said, you know, you're allowed to be as unrealistic as you want. That's fine. But then 
don't come back and, and blame the system, right? Like you're allowed to hold on to unrealistic expectations. My goal in having this conversation is to kind of get singles to be a little bit more open, a little bit more realistic. I heard from another Sharhan, you know, if you're realistic, you can get married. And I really, I really do believe that. I think that if you really focus on what truly matters and you accept that things might not come exactly how you expected, and it's not a reflection on you, you know, like, oh, I didn't get such a good looking guy as my friend. Like I'm, I'm less than, it's not about that. It's what truly matters in a marriage because when we are all old, right? Like that old couple I told you about, there is no good looking or bad looking. There is no, you know, status, quote unquote. It's, it's really, who's the person who's holding your hand? Who's the person who's going to be there for you? What truly matters in a marriage? So if I were to just give you like literally just, again, three little quick tips with attraction, the beginning of dating, I would say number one, look at it as a baseline, especially when looking at a picture. Number two, see if it has grown throughout the dates um, or if it's stagnant or going down. Number three, define for yourself what you think you should be feeling and be honest if those feelings or expectations are realistic. I've always said this to couples, you know, you cannot get engaged if you don't think Shomar Nagia is hard. And I can't tell you like how many dates at that point you should be hard. But I think that at the moment that you say, you know what? I could marry this person, right? You're already thinking about getting engaged. It means that you have connected and your friendship has grown. And the most natural progression and way of expression is the Shomunikia aspect. So if that's not difficult, then at that point, it's like, that's, you know, that's obviously not going to work. You know, I've said this to girls before when they're like, I'm not attracted. And I've said this to them. I will not allow you to get engaged if you don't tell me that it's not difficult to be Shomunikia. And I can't tell you how many girls, Baruch Hashem, um, I have set up and they kind of give it time and then they're like, wow, it's hard now. You know, like it really, really does grow. So again, three main things that really, truly matter in a marriage. Number one, friendship, respect, support. Number two, having fun together, enjoying each other's companies, feeling good. And number three, attraction and chemistry. You know, after the last episode, somebody actually sent me a message. By the way, I love the feedback. Please reach out. I would I love to incorporate this in further episodes. And this is what she said. Quote, if your vibes are good, but nothing makes sense on paper, or if everything makes sense on paper, but there are no vibes, what should you do? End quote. <laughs> so this is my response to her. And we actually had a bit of like a voice note convo on this. I think if your vibes are good, then maybe you need to check what's on your paper, right? What are you defining as what's important in marriage? Well, what do you need? Did you write down what you need or what you want? Is it a preference or is it a need? Is it an expectation? Is it, Are you putting down what you think other people expect you to have of what's going to help your status, of what your friends all got to marry? Or are you really writing down things that that for you are, are, are important? And I think you have to really pinpoint the things that are not matching, if that's the case, if you're vibing good, but nothing makes sense on paper, and be honest if you can live with those things. I'll give you an example. Um, this happens all the time. You know, People call me and they say, you know, we're having this, this difference. How do I know to move forward or not? So I always say you have to differentiate between a standalone issue and something that's representative of a bigger issue. So somebody called me about um, they were having a a difference in hair covering. So he wanted her to cover her hair fully and she did not want to, but she was willing to compromise for it. Like she she was willing to say, you know what, I'll do it for you. Which Whether that's good or not, we could speak about in a different time. Feel free to send me your thoughts on that. But in this case, she was willing to compromise. And I said to her, okay, putting aside whether you should or should not compromise, is this a standalone issue? Is your only big difference the hair covering? Or is the hair covering representative of a bigger difference because most of the time these little differences really represent an ashkafic difference which might play up in what school you want to send your kids to what community you want to live in um you know i had um another couple you know call me and the difference was uh, non-jewish music right she did not listen to it and he did and again i had the same discussion well is the only difference the, the, the non-Jewish music? Or does the non-Jewish music represent something bigger? You know, does it impact the shkafa of how you're going to raise your kids, right? Of, of other examples. And it turned out there were, there were many other examples, right? Like he felt comfortable going to a co-ed gym, for example. And she was like, no. So again, it's, you have to think about it. If things are not matching up on paper, it's not necessarily a red flag, but you need to notice the differences, define them, and be honest. If that's something that you can live with, 
Is it a standalone issue or is it a percentage of something bigger? I think any relationship forces you to be a little bit selfish, right? To give, to compromise. But as my cousin Shana said last week, and I love this, it's compromise, not sacrifice. You don't have to suffer in marriage. We don't, we don't need martyrs here. You don't have to suffer with friends either, by the way, side point. But we do sometimes have to compromise. And the only one who can say if that's a compromise that you're willing to live with, or if it's a sacrifice, is really you. So, you know, I, I give you an answer for what truly matters in marriage, right? What should you be looking for? And notice that I didn't list any religious preferences or, or, or any of the other things that people focus on. I do think they're very important because I think they kind of go under the category of values and respect. Um, you need to have a similar vision of life, what family you want to build. You know, I was once working in a school and there was a secular teacher there who was you know, unfortunately married to an unaffiliated Jew and she was uh, pregnant. I think she was giving me a ride to like a, a teacher workshop or something or other. And they had been together for nine years. And she was telling me how they haven't figured out what religion they're going to raise the baby in. I was like, I was in shock. I was like, what do you mean? You've been together for nine years and you've never discussed raising kids? You know, it's like the opposite of how we approach things. But you know, there has to be a balance. I remember when I was dating, there was a friend of mine who got into an argument with a guy she was dating about their future children. And at the end, she was like, but we don't even have any kids yet. Like, what are we arguing about imaginary fake children? So you have to obviously laugh, but there has to be like this in between, right? When, when I'm setting people up, I really try to cover two things for you. I really think Hashkafa is super important. I think you have to be on the same page Hashkafically. You might not even have to be on the same page, maybe just the same chapter. And that's again, where it comes down to you really figure it out what the difference is, if that's something you can live with and compromise with, or if it's representative of just like a different mindset that will keep playing up. Um, this is actually advice that my husband and I got when we were dating. We, um, one, one of his marriage friends said to us, you know, whatever you argue about now, you're going to keep arguing about for the rest of your lives. It just plays up in different ways. And I can't tell you how true that is for anyone that I've mentioned this to. They're like 100%. So you want to just, again, when you have these differences, kind of figure out, okay, standalone issue or just like a bigger issue. And number two is, I really always try to think about personality match when I set people up. I think that when you're trying to build a friendship, which is really what dating is, you're building a friendship. You're, You're building the ultimate friendship in your life then you want to kind of just make sure that, you know, personality-wise, um, it's it, it works. So I was thinking of a cute way to end this episode. And I was like, you know what, let me think if there's like a word that can serve as like an acronym um, that kind of like some of everything we've discussed. So I wanted to, I, I, I was trying this like a bunch of words. And I was like, you know what, let's do friends. F-R-I-E-N-D-S. Okay. F, friendship, the basis of marriage. R, respect. That means never putting the person down or isolating them from friends or loved ones. I, interest. You have to have some common ground, right? Have fun together. E, emotional connection. Some might call it attraction. I call it chemistry. N, nearly perfect. Be realistic with your expectations. D, develop. Good things take time and grow. And last but not least, S, support for life. Till next time, my friends, relationships truly do rock, and I hope that you find yours soon.